Tonight on EWTN Live, we're going to look at the fascinatingly normal side of one of the greatest female saints of the 20th century. So please stay with us. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. And our guest tonight is an Austrian priest who was a spiritual advisor, confessor, and translator for Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta and has since authored a book about his experiences about with her that's entitled Mother Teresa of Calcutta a personal portrait. And he's also here at the network taping a new series about Blessed Mother Teresa for our English and our German channels. So please welcome Father Leo Mahasburg. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very Herzlich much. Herzlich willkommen. <laughs> Danke sehr. Danke <laughs> sehr. sehr. It's great to have you here, Father Mossburg. We've been Thank looking you forward to you uh, being a guest here for some time. And you know, one of the uh, questions I'm sure, uh, we'll have a number of questions, but one of them is, how did you first become acquainted with Blessed Mother Teresa? By chance. <laughs> by chance. Now, as a Jesuit, I might say by providence, but go ahead. <laughs> By chance, because I, I was a secretary to Bishop Nilitzer, who was a Jesuit bishop, mm -hmm. and he had the charism, that means the special gift, not to speak English. Uh -huh. And so with my little English, I served as his translator between Mother Teresa and him. I see. And he was very, very friendly with her. He met her in 1965, when he accompanied Pope Paul VI to Bombay for the Eucharistic Congress. And there they met, he met Mother Teresa and took her to meet Paul, Paul, Paul VI. And they liked each other and Paul VI invited Mother Teresa to come to Rome. And when she came to Rome, he asked Bishop Nilitzer to help her to find a place, to get a house and, and so on. And so they were very friendly, but they spoke, they both, Bishop Nilitzer was Slovak, Mother Teresa was Albanian. So they understood the Slo Slavonic language, but it was not a real conversation. No, they could no, sort of chit-chat, but they could not right. go into deep things. Right. Thanks God, that's how I came into the picture. Uh -huh. I, you know, I actually knew Bishop Nilica myself. You know uh, him. I came across him uh, a, a, in a number of places during my travels and uh, did, did a little bit of work with him too. Uh, really? Bishop Nilica was a very, very Ladies interesting man. Yes. Yes, he was a bishop when he was 29. He was secretly ordained. Right. And he was... And, that, and that's because it was the communist times in, in what was then Czechoslovakia. Right. And Pius XII had given the order to, to the Jesuits to maintain the secret hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And so they always ordained two bishops. One started working, ordaining priests and so on. And the other one was in hiding. Once the first one was discovered, the second one became active and ordained another bishop himself. Right. So Bishop Nilitzer, for example, ordained what is who is today Cardinal Koretz, mm -hmm. another Jesuit bishop. So, and I remember the day when we were seven uh, Czechoslovak bishops, all Jesuits, the whole hierarchy, which was ordained, one was ordained by the other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was very fascinating after the after the breakdown of the communist sure. system. Sure. Yeah, the, there were a number of stories like that. Uh, that I, I know from some Jesuits mm -hmm. who were in, in Soviet Union in those right. days, and mm -hmm. uh, it was fascinating. Oh, fantastic uh, stories, yes. Yes, really mm -hmm. is. Great heroes, great heroes mm -hmm. uh, uh, under communism. Yeah. But then your relationship with Blessed Mother Teresa, you know, took its own life. How did that occur? 
Well, it occurred, but she, she found out that I had a car. <laughs> <laughs> and so she said, Father, could you take three sisters to the airport? And I said, when? Well, this afternoon? I said, fine, I can do it. So I came back at three o'clock in the afternoon and she came with the three sisters. And I noticed that the sisters had boxes like this with a roll inside, two saris, a Bible, and a few personal belongings. And I said, where are we going? Are we going on a picnic or what are you? No, no, Father, we go to the airport. I said, yes, but where are you going? Are you going away for a day or two? No, no, we're going to Argentina. I said, how long for? Maybe five to 10 years. I said, when did they tell you? This morning. <laughs> I was just a newly ordained priest by then, and I thought their vow of obedience and my vow of obedience, whether they are, if there are any similarities. Yeah, yeah. Amazing, amazing. amazing. Just, but also, not only their vow of obedience, but the ability in their poverty to right. have everything in a box right. Right. and take it with right. them. Right. Poverty is freedom. Yeah. Mother Chisa. Yeah. Poverty is freedom. And she stressed poverty very much because she said poverty really protects the other vows. Obedience without poverty is unthinkable. <coughs> Chastity without poverty, inner poverty, is unthinkable. And they have a fourth vow to free, free service, uh, full hearted and free service to the poorest of the poor. Mm. Another protected by the vow of poverty. Yeah. So I believe that, that she, she made the key, the poverty, and this is not really taken from far away because the, our Lord himself said, blessed the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So this is the key to, the, to all the other Beatitudes. And so Mother Teresa took that seriously. Sure, very seriously. Very. And, and truly uh, sought out the poorest of the poor in countries all over the world, uh, right. from first world countries like the United States and Europe to right. extremely poor countries, sometimes called fourth world, they're, they're right. so poor. Well, she, she basically distinguished, not intellectually, but as a matter of fact, between three levels of poverty. The material poverty, which we found mainly in India and the third world countries, then she moved in 64, she moved to New York, London, Vienna, spiritual, uh, social poverty, mm -hmm. loneliness, throw away of society, she called it. People who are not necessary for the society anymore. So they are completely derelicted. And the third level was the communist countries, spiritual poverty, not to be able to know God. And if you know him, not to practice your religion for her. These two were the most difficult, difficult poverties. Mm -hmm. And I remember when we, I was lucky because she, she asked me to come to the Soviet Union with her when she founded the first house. And I had just received from my brother a nice modern computer, you know, these machines. Yeah, yeah. And this computer was so modern, it had two drives. You could copy from one drive to the other. It was extraordinary. That was 1988. And I wanted to take the computer. And Mother Teresa said, Father, you know, better not to. Better not to take that computer. Better give humble service, humble love and service. Whew, that was difficult. <laughs> it was very difficult. And then six months later, she phoned from Calcutta and she said, Father, you still want to take the computer? And I said, I don't really need it. Father, now you can take it. <laughs> So, because one aspect of poverty is not only the lack of things, right. but also the interior yeah. detachment from. So that you say, you know, if I don't have this, then I'm fine. Mm -hmm. That's a very important thing. And that was, it was, I was very lucky because already my luggage went lost on the way to Moscow. Mm -hmm. So the, the computer would have been lost immediately. Sure. And then, since the luggage was lost, we reached, a few days later, we reached Yerevan in Armenia. There was a Soviet Republic by mm -hmm. then. Right. And there was the, on the 12th of December, I believe, it was a big earthquake yes. with about 35,000 dead. And Mother Teresa immediately said, I bring you my sisters to help. And they accepted. And we were there 
on the 25th of December, 1988. And I remember we reached and there were only a very a little cupboard <laughs> was, that was my bedroom and I had absolutely nothing, nothing. And Mother Teresa came and, s and gave me uh, dry plums. So I ate the plums and then I was about to spit off the, the, the seed. The seed. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, no, stop, stop. Maybe this can be used for something. And I used it as a teen teeth brush uh -huh. for a couple of days uh -huh. until I got another one. <laughs> but it was, but you see, today when I look back, these were the most beautiful days of my life. Matter of fact, I was uh, slated to meet Mother Teresa uh, that very year, but because of the earthquake, she had to cancel what she was going to do here mm -hmm. and go over to yeah. Armenia. Yeah. So I, I, I never got a chance to meet yeah, her. Yeah, she, she changed her plans according to needs. Yep. And, uh, uh, and for example, I had made my plan for Christmas 1988. I hadn't seen my family for a long time time and I promised my sisters to be in Munich so on the way it was the 19th of December on the way via Vienna I went via Vienna to go to Munich in Vienna I got a, a fax from Mother Teresa dear father Leo come immediately bring everything God bless you Mother Teresa and so I promised my sister I said you will see I'll be back for Christmas you know it was the 19th so 24th I'll be back I'll be back I came back mid-July <laughs> So you didn't get there for Christmas at all. Now, <laughs> that all. Uh, but I had the most extraordinary Christmas, I can yeah. tell you, in a KGB lounge, because we had to, to wait for an airplane, which was late. Mm -hmm. And you had all the, the KGB people sitting there, and amongst them, six or seven sisters of Mother Teresa and Mother Teresa herself. At a certain moment, Mother Teresa fell asleep by reading the Pravda, the, the Soviet newspaper, newspaper right. which means the truth. truth. And Which she, was anything but. And she was sitting under the picture of Lenin. <laughs> it was such a, such a coincidence of things. Sure, sure. But then the sisters distributed food to everybody in the lounge. The people didn't know what, what happened to them. Somebody giving them something free. <laughs> and they, I believe they touched many hearts just oh, by the gentleness no with no which doubt. they did it. No doubt. Yeah, it, um, certainly dealing with that spiritual poverty in atheistic uh, communist lands where there had also been horrible devastation and, and material poverty uh, of tremendous, you know, the, the state was just spiritual. very poor right, right. in being able to give people what they needed. You see, I had a lot of time to reflect in Armenia and I, I remember that it became clearer and clearer to my mind that the Soviet Union being the first atheistic state, which had atheism as a state doctrine, which has expelled God consciously and willfully from its social life, developed three characteristics. First, concept of truth. They lost every concept of truth. Lenin, the founder of communism, said, true is what serves the party. That means he founded a new religion. If I don't have a religio, I'm not bound back to, I find, I find my own. So yeah, as a matter of fact, and, and that's one of the things a lot of folks don't know, but mm -hmm. the word religion comes it's from a word in religion. Latin meaning to bind back. Yeah, back. back. Mm -hmm. So the first, there was no truth, but what they did mean in practical life, it meant you could not trust anybody. You could not trust your husband, you could not trust your wife, yeah. not your children. For example, I was told by the sisters when they went to, to to, to look for the old people in, in these huge buildings where thousands of people lived, they again and again they met young people and they were asking, where are your parents? Are they dead? Oh no, oh no, no, where are they? Well, they're in the, in the, in the psycho psychological homes. I said, how come? Both of them. And they found out that they denounced their parents to be sick in their minds in order to have the apartment for themselves. Yes. I mean, when, when the trust breaks in such a terrible way, you create a poverty which is unthinkable and unimaginable. That's the first. The second, you could not trust judgments. There was no legal system. There was no independent legal system. We met a very, very interesting lady. She, she invited us and I, I went to see her with a translator. 
And she said, I'm the youngest judge in the Soviet Union. And uh, I said, fine, very nice. And she started talking about Rilke, German poet. Right. And she was very educated. And I said, well, why did you, why did you study law? I'm, I'm a lawyer myself, so I was very interested. She said, well, I was just ambitious. And, and I did it. With 29, I was the first and the youngest judge in the Soviet Union. That moment, the telephone rang. Already assigned it, she was a KGB member because nobody had a telephone who was not a member of the party. And she went to the telephone. We were continuing our meal. She came back crying. And uh, I said, what had happened? She said, well, my niece uh, played with a knife and she hurt both her eyes so she might lose her eyesight. And she was completely devastated. And it was a very strange situation to e continue eating. Certainly she turned around and said, Father, can't you help? I said, I'm not a medical doctor, you know, but you're a priest. I thought, oh Lord, what, what, should, I, what should I do? And I, I, I remembered that Mother Jesus had given me some miraculous medals. And, and I took two medals from my pocket. I gave her two medals and I said, give one of the medals your niece, hang it around her neck, and one you ca carry yourself and you pray to Our Lady every day, Mary Bogorodica, Mother of God, heal my niece. Two weeks later we were invited again. She was completely changed. Her niece was healed. Both eyes were saved and she started talking. She thought that she wanted to get rid of everything which was in her. And she said that she had bought her way to the, to the career with every price she could pay. Sure. And then she said, and you see now it's six years that I'm a judge. And in these six years I've never ever made a ruling myself. I only signed the papers I got from the party in six years. That's the concept of truth. Yeah. Yeah. And then just to finish that, that <laughs> Susanna was her name. She then, she was baptized years later, two, or two years later was baptized in an evangelical church. And then she died one year later of cancer. Mm. So it was a very providential, so she came, and a very she interesting. She did come to faith. Yes, and she you know, came to faith. Th th that this never would have occurred had Mother Teresa not gotten this mission right. into this into spiritually Soviet, yeah, poor yeah, place right. uh, and, and started you know, working there. And had she not given me the miraculous medals. Yeah. <laughs> now, one, th this brings out uh, another aspect of Mother Teresa. Uh, she was famous for being uh, at the, at the minimum, very strong-willed. She had a determination. At the maximum, some called her a spiritual dictator. A benevolent dictator. A bene a benevolent, benevolent dictator. dictator. Um, how did that uh, help her or hurt her in, in the work that she did? Well, maybe it hurt her as well, but I only saw where it helped her, mm -hmm. that she she knew very well. She had, she had a very open mind when it came to decision making. She distinguished decision making and decision taking. In the process of decision making, she asked everybody's counsel. She asked everybody's opinion, especially priests and bishops. She, she had a very open ear. And I remember a friend of mine told me, please be careful what you advise. She's going to do it. <laughs> 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 so, in any way, that was decision making. And then she withdrew, prayed, and then she made her decision. And she would never blame anybody who advised her if the decision was wrong. That was her decision, her responsibility. And that got her through many things, especially in the Soviet Union. Yeah, sure. I remember one, one instance which I, I describe in the book because it was so striking. She got me very in the very early stage of our friendship, I could say, to take her to the Vatican. And not only that she wanted me to be there at four o'clock in the morning, I said, Mother Jesus, the Vatican is opening at six o'clock in the morning. You cannot get in before that. So we, I, I, I bargained with her and we, I got her to half past five. And then we stood there in a, for an hour waiting for the Holy Father's Mass in the car. And I had only taken her there. I was not meant to, to come with her. And when she got out from the car, she said, Father, come, come. I said, Mother, you, I won't get in here. I, I know the rules of this, of this castle. 
And she said, no, no, Father, you're with us. The Swiss guard immediately said, Mother Teresa, the Father is not on the list. And she said, no, but he's with us. Father, come, come, come. And so I said, okay, I go, but I know I will not even, I will not even enter the, the ascensore, the lift. No? Right. And so we entered the lift, and, and she said immediately to the, the lift driver, she said, Father is with us, Father is with us. I know, Father is with us. So he didn't dare to say anything. And then I thought, but I'm sure I will not pass the police in front of the Holy Father's apartment. And so we got on the long corridor, and I saw the policeman already in front of the door. And so we walked and walked, and I got more and more nervous, and I thought they would send me back, of course. And then they stopped us and said, good evening, uh, or good morning, Mother Teresa. Yes, you and the sister, but Father is not on the list. No, but Father is with us. No, no, Father cannot enter. Um, who can give permission? Well, no, the Holy Father or Monsieur Jivish. And say, okay, stay here, I ask. And she passed by the, the guard, in, and the guard didn't know what to do. And she, Mother, she said, no, oh, okay, go, go, go. <laughs> and he pushed me into the Holy Father's apartment. And then Monsieur Jivish came, and he, and he laughed and said, um, oh, you are here too. And Mother, she said, Monsieur, Father, Father will celebrate with the Holy, can celebrate with the Holy Father. She didn't ask, could he, may he? She yes. said, he will concelebrate with the Holy yes. Father. And Monsieur Jesus just smiled and took me, and took me off yeah. for the concelebration. <laughs> well, you know, there have been many times over the past years that I've thought nuns like Mother Teresa and our own Mother Angelica would be very apt at running the world's governments. If nothing else, everything would be clean. And secondly, they, they, First, they would correct. grab some of those folks by the earlobe and make them sit down and behave. Uh, right. You know, they, they, they had a way of mm -hmm. knowing, you know, wanting to do what's right for its own sake. And there was, and right. people, they could get away with this because yes. nothing was there for themselves. It was all to serve God. Do you think the reflection is correct that our Lady had the same role amongst the Apostles? This I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Because I always imagined the Apostles would be very sort of hot, hot-tempered people. Mm. And so they would have started arguing afterwards who, who was to blame for, right. the, for the disaster. Right. But with Our Lady there, maybe they didn't dare to. Yeah, like very well could be. Very well could be. So I think that's a special role for the women. Uh, absolutely, because the woman we in the, need them. Exactly, just by being there, just by being there, they already change the setting. Yep, absolutely. Now, uh, one of the things that I've noticed over many years is that people, even very secular people, people who are, you know, the Hollywood types, will say things like, uh, who do you think you are, Mother Teresa? Mm -hmm. She yes. became the norm for good behavior and, right. and, and generous behavior. And she was used as that norm by Christians and non-Christians non alike. Right. Right. Why was that so? My spontaneous answer would be because she was non-aggressive. She never, ever blamed anybody of anything. She explained that this is the reason, this is the reason, but she would never say you are guilty of this. And I remember that she said, when she was about 80, 82, she said, one sin I had never to confess that I judged anybody. Imagine how, how beautiful if you could say that. Exactly. No? But she really didn't judge you. She, she told you very clearly, this is wrong what you're doing. But she never had a resentment, let alone hate you or reject you. No? She was always open, always open for everybody, for every reconciliation, immediately, immediately. No resentment, no hatred. And I believe we felt that immediately. You felt at ease with Mother Teresa immediately. You didn't have to sort of to, to fight for being close to her. She, she, opened, she was open for everybody. And we had to look to sort of get a certain order into the people when they came to meet her. And so I noticed that from the, let's say, 100 or 200 people who came in the morning, about 150% left crying. She had a special tenderness, a special motherly tenderness 
to tell the people clearly what the problem was with them, but without hurting them. Mm -hmm. And so they, were, they could open up. And I believe that's, that's probably the, the ability. We always tried to, to, uh, tried to, to trigger her to tell us something negative, what she experienced with anybody. You know, how were the communists in Russia? And, and, and she said, they were so good to us. I said, yes, but Mother Teresa, you know, communists, and they probably used you. And No, 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 you know, Natasha even came to, to pick us from the airport and so on. So she never drew into that, she, she called it carrying tales. Mm -hmm. Don't carry tales. Never, ever. In these seven years, I can testify that she never, ever said a negative word about anybody. You know, one, one of the other things uh, that I think is related to this is that she was not known for uh, uh, profound philosophical <laughs> insights. Right. But what she said could yes. be so simple, right. you know, like God loves you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it would make people cry because it was, resonated right. from right. deep within her, and that was very key. Mm -hmm. Yes, I experienced it in one of the first days after my ordination. I, I asked her, Mother Teresa, why, is, why doesn't Africa develop more quickly? I tried to, to drag her into an academic sure. reflection. And she said, Father, you know, we don't think about these things. We look at the need, and if we can help, we help. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Stop. Yep. All the intellectual <laughs> discourse was finished. Right. But then I asked her one day, I asked her, Mother, she said, you know, your speech at the, at the Nobel Prize in 79 was so fantastic that there are people are writing their, their thesis on the subject. How did you prepare that? Mm. She took her rosary and said, Mm, like this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was simply something that came mm -hmm. out of her right. own love of Jesus, and Our yeah. Lady, and her ability. And this is another characteristic of her. She had an incredible ability to truly see Christ right. in other people. Yes. Certainly from the time I was a boy, you know, the sisters would say, you need to see Jesus in everybody. But... Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, it didn't cling, it didn't, yes. you know, make sense to me. With her, when she did it, there was, a, a, yes. an, again, authenticity. Yes. If, if we have a minute, I can tell you a nice story about this. Because she was completely Jesus-centered. She, she said, my first and only love was Jesus, the heart of Jesus. And she said, when I was five years old, already my first and only love was the heart of Jesus. Yeah. And that never left her. And then in 42, she made a special vow, I will never say no to Jesus. In 46, she didn't say no to him. And when she was over 80 years old, somebody suggested a course of action to her and she said, no, no, Jesus doesn't want that. And I've never said no to Jesus and I'm not going to start with it now. <laughs> Imagine how beautiful to be able to exactly. say when you're 82, I've never said no to Jesus. And that, that, that was her. Yeah. And so every, in, from the big to the smallest details, uh, once I was, we were on an invitation in Madras, in the, in the south of India, and there was a huge, a huge car, and government cars, and uh, military cars, and then politicians' cars, and journalists' cars, and so And she was placed with the archbishop in one of those huge cars. And I was chatting with a friend behind. I kept her waiting for about 45 minutes, and she had the whole state crew waiting for 45 minutes because where's Father Leo? <laughs> Iron, typical character. And then when, when I was found in a huge crowd, <laughs> of course I was that small by then, I sat into the car and we drove off. And I said, Mother Susan did say a word. Then she turned to me and said, Father, look. So I looked back at the back screen and that said VVIP. And I said, mm hmm. After a while, Father, do you know what it means? I said, yet, Mother. After a while, Father, what does it mean? <laughs> I said, it means very, very important person. Silence. Father, why do they, how, uh, 
whom do they mean? And I said, Mother, they mean you and, and the Archbishop. Silence. Father, why do they say that? I said, Mother, because of you, because of the Archbishop. I said, Oh no, Father, they say this because we bring them Christ. Well, it gets right to it. Gets right to it. Everything was geared on that. We're going to take a little break. Before we do, I want to mention that Father Leo Mossberg has written a book, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, A Personal Portrait. It is available at EWTN's religious catalog, and you can call them at 1-800-854-6316. 1-800-854-6316, or go to the website www.ewtnreligiouscatalog.com. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. We want to get your questions for Father and your comments, so please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, first of all, we'd like to invite you to come and join us like our studio audience has done tonight. And if you can make a pilgrimage down here to EWTN, we invite you to do that. Uh, you can call our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. Or you can also go to the website, www ewtn.com and they will help you with all sorts of information about scheduling of masses, the programs, tours of the studios, and places you can stay and eat and all that. So please come and join us. We'd love to have you. Father, are you ready for some questions? Yes, let's try. All right, let's go. First we have Rosary. Hello, Rosary. Hey, Father. How are you? Fine. Where are you from? <laughs> Uh, Houston, Texas. Houston, great. And what's your question? Well, Father, I was watching the Oprah Winfrey show a few months back, and she was interviewing Joel Osteen, the famous preacher here, you know, the mega Oh, sure, sure. Uh-huh. And she, in the course of their interview, she brought up Mother Teresa and said that, uh, you know, that it was revealed after her death that she had many struggles and, 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 and faith and, uh, you know, doubts. And uh, she asked him, have you ever experienced that? You know, and he says, well, no, I have to admit, you know, I've always, you know, never struggled like that. I've always trusted God and had faith in God. And after the interview, I just felt terrible, you know, for Mother Teresa that I felt like it was a misrepresentation of mm -hmm. what she had experienced. And I didn't really know exactly. I've heard myself, like I guess many people have heard that she did go through something that many people weren't aware of, you know. But I always thought it was that she wasn't filled with consolations and, and you know, that she had to uh, really struggle to trust herself that she was doing God's will. And it, it was more maybe a, a lack of her faith in herself, but not in God. Her, her biggest mantra was, uh, you know, Jesus, I love you and trust in you. And uh, I just felt sad for the media, and I didn't know, you know, many people felt the way I did, you know, of being, wondering what was going on with sure, you know, Mother sure. Teresa. It, it seemed like a negative thing to me. Well, let's, let's take a look and see what Father Mossberg has any uh, reflections on that. Yes. You know, I, 
see, one of the things that happened is that a lot of people in the press said that mm -hmm. she had doubts. What was going on? It's a very complex point because it goes, it digs deep into the mystery of the relationship between God and men. Uh, God is not really perceivable by us with our senses, uh, with our reason. And when the, develop, the, the friendship between God and man develops, we go through different stages. And Mother Teresa probably in that friendship has reached a point which probably only few reach, which is called the, the mystical union. It means complete oneness with the will of God, complete oneness with his promptings, with his desires. Remember the, the vow, I will never say no to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And this, at this stage, a famous saint in the Catholic Church tries to explain it, St. John of the Cross, and he, he calls it the dark night of the soul. And he explains that beautifully. He says, when the night is darkest, we don't see anything. When, it, when the night dawns, we start seeing shapes. shapes. Yeah. But then when we walk out into the, into the open light of the sun, we don't see anything anymore. And I understand the, the dark night of the soul of Mother Teresa that way. She stepped out not only from the darkness of sin into the half, the half light of hope, but she stepped into the complete light of faith. And that with all her will, with all her mind, with all her actions, with all her life. And so she was blinded by, by God. She was blinded by the beauty, by the depth. And it was a very hard time for her. And it was, according to what the, what the experts say, she was probably for 35 years in the dark night of the soul. The big saints like St. John of the Cross, one year and a half, St. Therese of Avila, three months, little Therese, one month. She was 35 years. And many people ask me whether we noticed anything of that dark night. And I must say, no, we didn't notice anything at all. She was, when, when I really tried to, 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 to pull out some, some remem remembrance of that, uh, maybe that when she was alone and when she f felt that there was nobody around, she was very, seri very serious, very serene, gesetzt. She was <laughs> and as soon as somebody entered, she brightened up like this, like li new light. And she always told her sisters, if you don't smile, make a smile. And she probably did it herself. And she mm. knew what she was talking about. Sure. She didn't probably feel like smiling because that pain not to feel God's presence, not to, not to understand his plans, not to, not to be able to relate to him. I remember one sentence she said, not to me, in, in one of her letters. She said, I send up my, when I send up my prayers to heaven, they return into my heart like swords. What did she mean by that? That's she an interesting way to, to, to uh, express she, that. She probably meant that her prayers not only didn't reach heaven, but they, they came back with a negative effect. And she said that the further I feel that God is withdrawing from me, the, the, my pain grows, but I don't know which pain is bigger, the pain of, his di of God distancing himself from me or the pain of my love and longing for him. So the, the further God withdrew, her love and longing grew for him. And I mean, we are talking in the realm of mystery. We are talking with all the limits of not only of my poor English, but of, of language as such. And, but I believe it's a, a big mystery. And, and Mother Jesus said, should I ever be a saint, I will be a saint of darkness because I will, I will try to come back to earth in the darkest spots of the earth in order to light a candle of hope. 
And I believe this comes precisely from her own darkness, sure. from just living by faith, just living by her will, just living. But on the other hand, she completely, completely trusted in God's providence. Because like a mathematic, she said, I'm his, so he is mine. I'm his, so he will look after us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, she had, oh, that, that you know, uh, came out very frequently. She had total confidence in God. Total, total. Yeah. Yeah. But of course she didn't understand. Very often she didn't understand when she, what, where was it in Tanzania? Dodoma, she took off with a small airplane. Um, and the, the, the airplane sort of fell back on the landing uh, strip and killed two sisters, killed one sister and hurt and two other people and hurt one person. And she was, she was, she, she was not hurt. The, the, the pilot was hurt, but she came out from the plane and she, she only said, God's will, God's will. She was completely broken by that, but she only said, God's will, God's will. Yeah. You know, that's uh, 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 something that Certainly, the secular-minded people uh, have great yes, difficulty yes. in being able to. They, yeah. The doubt yeah. is right. what they understand, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the the yeah. darkness that's part God. of one's deep relationship mm -hmm. with God right. that they don't right. understand. We had last Sunday's gospel, no? uh, last Sunday's reading, Anthroposakos uh, udechitaita tutiu, the 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 flesh man. Mm -hmm. does not understand yes, what yes, comes from exactly, the Spirit of God. Exactly. I mean, we can't even blame them. No, we can't even blame uh, somebody who has never learned about Christ, who has never learned about the Holy Spirit, who never, has no knowledge. How can he understand? He cannot. Yep. It's, a, it's a poverty. Exactly. And I think it's, we have to, to see this with a loving kindness and with tenderness and to invite people to, to learn about God and to, yeah. and to come closer to Him. Sure. I have another question from our studio audience. And where are you from? I'm from Germany. Oh, great. Good to have you. You're working with Father, I take it? Yes, oh, I'm great. taking care of uh, one of his shows. So, Father Liu, I have a question. Mother Teresa uh, thought that um, abortion would be the worst enemy of mankind. It could cause um, uh, a world war and would destroy our freedom. Could you analyze this, please? Well, this is this is probably a sentence from her, from her Peace Nobel, Nobel Prize speech. She said, um, "Abortion is the biggest the biggest uh, danger for world peace." And I remember very well that, that when I heard when I heard it first, I didn't understand it. I didn't mm -hmm. say, why why should abortion uh, put uh, peace in jeopardy? And now, about twenty five years passed since then more than 25 years past. And I must say that every day I understand it better, mm -hmm. that if you, through abortion, you allow a mentality which doesn't respect life, which doesn't see life as the supreme value for us, it's our life. It's, it's the only thing we have. If we, if we start muddling with, with who has the right to decide on somebody else's life, um, then the concept of the respect for life drops. And then what, what enters may be a utilitarian principle, what was road against Wade. Mm -hmm. uh, abortion is allowed because it's non-productive life. No? So you have an economic criteria because you're non-productive. I hope you're still productive, are you? Well, this is it. Stay productive. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Because not only the, the child is non-productive, but when we get a bit older, we may get less and less productive. Mm -hmm. And then, who decides upon our life? Exactly. Yeah. And we have the legislation in Belgium and in many countries where, where euthanasia has already arrived. Yes. But that's only the beginning. But then, remember the time on Hitler, when it, all, the, all the handicapped, they were not productive. So, so they were executed. Yeah. So we are very much on that line. And more and more, I understand that Mother Teresa was absolutely right. Abortion is the biggest endangerment of peace. There, there's an, another element too that um, I've been become increasingly concerned about, that in uh, China and now in parts of India, that it's 85 girls for every 100 right. boys. Right. 
in a population of 1.2 or 3 billion. That becomes, you know, there's already 15 million men for whom there is no right. woman. Right. And when that becomes 75 million men for whom there's no woman to marry, I mean, this is an astounding number. Right. And what will society do with them? How will you know, the, the role of the feminine to, mm -hmm. you know, help mm -hmm. civilize right. the, the masculine, that will mm -hmm. be lost. And here in this country, we see those who call themselves feminist are promoting this as their right and that they, they are you know, fighting tonight, in fact, right. for defense of that right to make sure mm -hmm. we can have a child taken out of us if we think that it's in our way. Mm -hmm. This is right. very problematic. I remember that, I remember that spot saying, um, my bulk belongs to me. My, my, my womb. My womb belongs yeah, my, to me. Yeah, my womb belongs to me. And the, the religious sister said, yes, as long as there's nobody else inside. Yes. <laughs> I like that very much. We have another call. I have Maureen on the line. Hello, Maureen. Oh, hi, Father Mitch. And, hi. Uh, Where are you from? Father, I'm from Staten Island, New York. Great. And thank you both for such a beautiful uh, show. Yes. Uh, my, and I was privileged to be with you several years ago. But my question is, my granddaughter is going to make her confirmation in October, and she told me she's taking the name Teresa. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. Which St. Teresa? And she said, oh, no, it's for Mother Teresa. And I was just wondering, being she isn't declared a saint, you know, when they have to write up about the saint, if that would be okay. And thank you. Maureen, don't worry about it. <laughs> Teresa... She will be a saint one day, maybe in 100 to 200 years, maybe in two years, we don't know. But she will be a saint for sure. And she is already blessed. She is a declared blessed. Yes. And uh, she, will, she, she also is very open-minded. She will not mind if, if you say, okay, in case that she doesn't become a saint, maybe the little Therese will join or will, will take her place or so. Right. Uh, don't worry, don't worry. Just pray to Mother Teresa for intercession for your niece, and that's the best you can do. And and certainly, you know, the, the idea that your niece has of having to do some study of Mother Teresa and learn more yes. about Mother Teresa's yeah. life will be a very positive yes. thing for that niece. Yes. We have another caller. Hello, Camille? Yes, hello. Hi, where are you from? From New Braunfels, Texas. I know where it is. And thank you both so much. It's a wonderful program. Thank you, ma'am. And what's your question tonight? My question is, um, Mother Teresa seems to be, to me, the epitome of uh, the contemplative who went out and served the world and changed the world. Um, I, I would like to know what Father thinks about how she accomplished that um, any, any insight into how we can help many more people learn to be more like her and to be contemplatives who truly do make a difference for God? That's a wonderful question, yes. There are ways. The first is well, to ask Mother Jesus to guide us, sorry? I, I was going to say, first of all, explain a little bit more about the contemplative, contemplative. part of Mother Teresa's life, yeah. uh, so that people then understand Camille's question right. from that context. Mother Teresa herself said, we are not social workers, we are contemplatives in the world. We, we give our whole life just, one could say, watching, watching the marvels of God in the world. And she could, she could put, it was not her saying, but one can apply it to her, she could put her cell a contemplative cell in the midst of the marketplace and she would contemplate God inside and from that God speaks in the silence of our heart and we listen and from the fullness of our heart we speak to God and that's prayer. So she was always repeating to her sisters, silence of your heart, find the, the time to be with God and at the beginning the sisters said one hour of adoration a week. 
And then a certain moment, the sister suggested that they could give up this hour of adoration because they had so much work to do. And Mother Jesus said, oh, you give me a good idea. We should have an hour of adoration every day so that we can be more with the Lord. And then if we're more with him, we'll be more joyful. If we're more joyful, more would join, and then we can do more work. So let's have adoration every day. And since then, the whole congregation has one hour of adoration every day with all that workload, which is really, really big. But they carry not only the workload into the adoration, but they carry the adoration into their work. We have to pray our work, Mother Teresa kept, kept repeating. We have to pray the work. That and, means and also part of that was, was not only that they took the time for adoration. Daily Mass was also yes, yeah. essential. Well, Mother Teresa herself probably prayed at least three and a half to four hours a day with all her workload. Yeah. Uh, explicit prayer. But then she prayed continuously. She had her rosary in her hand day and night, one could say. And as soon as she had a moment free, you would see bloop, bloop, bloop her rosary. And I, I wanted to ask you because I, I observed her. I, I could sit close to her from time to time and I saw that she prayed bloop, bloop like this fairly quickly. And I thought that was too quick. That's not a Hail Mary. And so I wanted to ask her what, what did she pray? But I'm sorry, can't tell you. I didn't. I, did, I was, I was, I was not courageous enough to ask oh, her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but probably but, she but prayed. That, but that contemplation was something that was essential to her life. That was the root of her of her activities. And other prayer permeated activity, and she accomplished great activities. Yes, um, and the question was, how can we learn to contemplate? Probably there are many schools, but Mother Teresa would say, just be with Jesus. Be with Jesus either in the Eucharist or be with Jesus in the poorest of the poor. Because he longs for you, he's longing for you. He desires you, he's thirsting for you. And when we, when we approach the poor with love and tenderness, we approach Jesus. So we, we contemplate him in the poorest of the poor. And she said, you cannot love Jesus if you don't put your love for him into a living action. You have to change your love for Jesus into a living action. So that's uh, probably where we learn to know Jesus and we were, where we start to contemplate him. We have just a couple minutes left, but I want to uh, have, uh, get a call from John. Hello, John. Hello, Father Mitch. How are you doing? Pretty good today, and how are you? Well, thank you. What's your question? My question would be, besides Mary and Joseph, did uh, Mother Teresa have some favorite saints, and what did she uh, like about them? Thank you. So I have about a minute or so. Yeah. so. I believe that uh, the, the little Therese was a very important saint. Saint Therese of Lisieux. Saint Therese of Lisieux, and also Therese of Avila. They were her name saints. Sure. Uh, she was Teresa. No? And so I believe that she also took a lot from her because, for example, that beautiful saying, uh, God, one day God will not ask us how, how big things we did, but how much love we put in the doing, that comes from little Therese. Mm -hmm. And so she, she took, she took, she, she liked very much Cardinal Newman, although he was not yet a saint, now he's a blessed, but she took his prayer, dear Jesus, help us to spread your fragrance everywhere we go. She loved it. Loved it. So I believe she has a number of saints. Last not least, um, Saint Cabrini. She said, she, this saint worked with the Indians and she became a complete Indian. No? Why can't I do that in India with my Indians? Yes. <laughs> so, so probably she had favorites and the Therese, the ancestors Therese, they were her favorites, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's, um, you know, uh, important for all of us. We, you know, we live in a time where there's so many anti-heroes and, and villains that are looked up to. And uh, these saints are absolutely key for us to take a look at. Father. But we have a saint, Mother Teresa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Among many, many, many others. Saints. We have run out of time. 
I want to thank you very much for being with thank us you. here to make your series in German as well as in English and to be on this show. And I'd like you to join me in blessing our audience. May Almighty God bless you, you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you and lead you in all of your ways. The and Father, the, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And you know, we can have Father here to make two series, one in English, one in German, and have them here with this program and all the other people who come here. So please uh, remember that this is your network and you need to keep us in between your, uh, your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill so we can pay our bills. Thank you.